Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy Pierpont, and I'm the Marketing and Special Events Director at the Kent Memorial Library. On behalf of House of Books and Kent Memorial Library, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special conversation and virtual book signing with author Michael Riedel and Tom Senapietro. They will be discussing Michael's new book, Singular Sensation, The Triumph of Broadway. Helping us tonight is our technology point person, Amanda Myers. She has asked me to remind you, if you are experiencing technical difficulties, please type it in the chat and she will connect with you to troubleshoot. And we will save time at the end for Q&A. If you have a question throughout the program, please type it into the chat and we will ask the question on your behalf. I will also put in the chat the website for House of Books and where you can go to purchase your signed book by Michael. And now I'm excited to introduce you to tonight's guests. No stranger to the Kent Memorial Library, Tom Senapietro has been our guest lecturer on a number of occasions. Tom was a childhood friend of mine, but since our piano playing childhood, he has managed 30 Broadway shows over the last 25 years and the author of eight books, including the best-selling Sound of Music story. Michael Riedel has been the theater columnist for the New York Post since 1998. New York Magazine has called his column a must read for the theater world. Michael began his radio career as a regular on the I Miss in the Morning show in 2011. In 2017, WOR, New York's oldest and highest rated station, asked him to co-host its morning show with well-known sportscaster Len Berman. The Len Berman and Michael Riedel in the morning show is the highest rating morning radio program in the New York City area. Michael's book, Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway, won the Marfield Prize for Arts Writing in 2015 and is widely considered to be the successor to William Goldman's celebrated 1967 book about Broadway, The Season. A graduate of Columbia University, Michael lives in the West Village. Welcome to you both, Tom and Michael. Lucy. Hello. Hi. I'm glad, I, I'm glad Amanda's here to help me with the uh, technical difficulties because I've had tech, technical difficulties my entire life. So thank you, Amanda. There you go. And don't look to me because I'm a tech idiot. So I know, so am I. Exactly. Here. I'm um, an old fashioned person, Tom. I mean, I write these, these old fashioned things called books. Remember those? I do remember those, yes. <laughs> Well, Michael, look, it's a, it's a terrific book. It's a great read. It's, a, it's so much fun. I, I recommend it to everybody listening. And I, I wanted to start, before we get to the specific shows you talk about, I want uh, really just with the structure of the book, what made you decide, oh, I, I want to write about the decade of the 1990s on Broadway. How did you use that as the framing device? You know, uh... The thing is, uh, my old uh, my old friend Tita Khan, the widow of Sammy Khan. Um, whenever anyone asks Sammy, uh, you know, what comes first, the music or the lyrics, and he says the check. And essentially, um, I, I I got an advance from Simon and Schuster to write a second book after Razzle Dazzle, so I had to come up with something, and I was a little, frankly, hard pressed to come up with it. Um, and I came up with a bunch of ideas, and my editor Ben Lunen, a wonderful guy, great editor. Every idea I pitched to him, he was like, man, could be, maybe he was kind of bored with my ideas. And then over drinks one night, he said, you know what, I would like, um, I'd like to know the rest of the story of Broadway. You told the story in Razzle Dazzle of Broadway coming back in the 60s and the 70s and in the 80s. And he said, there, you know, there's a, there's another story to be told. So I thought, well, I could do a sequel. And then I, my original scheme was to take the um, book up to Hamilton because, you know, Hamilton is arguably, you know, as famous as any movie TV show of all time. I mean, everybody knows Hamilton. But, you know, I thought, oh, that's a, that's a long book. That's, you know, to go from the 90s up to the 2010 with Hamilton. 
that's a long book. And then it occurred to me, Tom, because I was a reporter uh, covering Broadway in the 1990s as a kid reporter. And I thought, you know what? The 90s, that was an interesting period. All art forms have a kind of decade where things change. You mm -hmm. know, if you think about, you know, the, the, the golden age of Broadway is pretty much from uh, what, 43 with Oklahoma up to the end of maybe Sound of Music. So that's maybe what, 15, 15 yeah. years or so, you know, kind of it. Um, Hollywood had its had its great moment and then the studio system collapsed. But in the 70s, you had the, the new directors like uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese came along. You had that decade of independent movies. And I thought, you know, a decade is kind of a good rounding off point. Uh -huh. And, and I thought, you know, the 90s, that was an interesting time because as I, be, I begin the book with um, Sunset Boulevard, which was the last of the big British spectacles. Right. It was Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh. They dominated Broadway in the 80s with Cats, Phantom, Les Mis, Miss Saigon. And the last one of those shows was Miss Saigon. I, I'm sorry, it was um, uh, um, uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard. And... I covered that show extensively, extensively because uh, you know it was ribbon with the uh, uh, scandal and Andrew fought with Patti Lapone and Glenn Close, and we can get into all those details. But as I was plotting out the scheme for the book, I thought, you know, that's some something happens there. You've got this show; it's the most expensive show of all time. It's Andrew Lloyd Webber at his absolute height. It's a fourteen million dollar show, which back in those days, Tom, as you know, was an extraordinary amount of money. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so Andrew wins the Tony Award in 1995 because the only competition is uh, Smokey Joe's Cafe, which was a review of the Lieber and Stoller songs. Right. right. So there's nothing going on. A year later, Andrew Lloyd Webber presents posthumously the Tony Award to one Jonathan Larson, who wrote the show that we'd never heard of back in the early 90s right. called Rent. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's how you, that's the shift. The Lloyd Webber world is over with. Jonathan Larson comes in. The Americans are back on Broadway again. Right. And the 90s is about the American musical and American plays coming back to Broadway in a way they had not been in a long time. And I thought, yeah. that's my starting point. Ah. And where's, where's, my, where's my end point? I mean, that's the thing. Because you, as you know, as a writer, you got to figure out, you got to find the end before you can have the beginning. Right. And I got the end because... I got up one morning here in the West Village where I live and I used to be able to look out my window here and I had a straight on view because I've lived here since 1996, straight on view of the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. Every morning I got up, I saw the Twin Towers. And one morning I got up and I looked at the North Tower and there was this black gash across it with smoke coming out. And I saw the second plane hit and I saw the towers fall. And I lived through that, that week where what was going to happen in New York City? Forget about Broadway. What was going to happen in New York City? Right. And but I remember calling my friend Jerry Schoenfeld, who was running the Schubert organization back then. And I said, Jerry, what's going? I said, Michael, we don't know. I mean, we're told that um, there are bombs in Times Square. We we can't open. You know, we don't know what we're, what we're going to do. And Rudy Giuliani, when he was saying, um, he wanted to show the world that uh, New York was still open for business and not brought to its knees by terrorists. And the best way he could do that was to tell all the Broadway producers, you have to light the lights of Broadway on Thursday night, two days after the attack on the World Trade Center. Right. I remember thinking, I said, that's a way to end a book. That right. caps the 1990s. And that's why I called it the triumph of Broadway. Because Tom, as you know, Broadway was, they, Broadway was up and running two days after the attack on the World Trade Center. Right. I mean, I went, the producers was the biggest show in town then. And I went with Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft. I went with them to the producers that night. Matthew and Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane were in it. And Mel and Ann and I were at the back of the theater. And maybe 500 people were there. You know, you could not get a ticket to it, but it was after a, right. an attack. And we watched Matthew and Nathan lead, you know, 500 people uh, singing God Bless America in tears. And I thought, that's how you, that's how you end a book. Right. Well, it, it's a, a you bookended it so well, and uh, it, it, you explain it, it, it so well in that answer. And you also have given me the perfect segue into my first two questions, because you mentioned the two shows I want to ask you about at the start. 
Um, the first one is Sunset Boulevard. And one, one of the things that struck me, so you have this, the most A-list show of all with all of these heavyweights, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Bob Avian and, and you know, first Patti LuPone and then Glenn Close. Yeah. And, and what I, what struck me in your retelling of it is we all kind of know about the Andrew's difficulties with Patty, but then as you point out, he also had a big falling out with Glenn at one point, and then there was the whole Faye Dunaway business. And I started thinking, was it the nature of the show, this diva centric show, or was it Andrew who, you know, his personality? Do you, and sort of as a tangent of that, do you like many people think it's his best score? Um, you know, I, I, I do think Sunset Boulevard has an absolutely sensational score. I think With One Look and As If We Never Said Goodbye are great musical theater songs. Yeah. No question about it. Um, I, I did think about this a lot. And I went back to myself, my little kid self covering Sunset Boulevard for the Daily News. And I, I went to the opening night. Remember that it was at the, uh, the Minskoff Theater, I think it was. Right. And I remember thinking, because I love the movie Sunset Boulevard, but I do remember thinking back then, and this was a little seed planted in my mind as I was writing this book. I thought this is, Sunset Boulevard is an intimate show. It's Norma Desmond, Joe Gillis, and Max von Stroheim, the butler. Mm -hmm. It's a triangle. Right. Three people. So it's, 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 it, it's intimate. But back in those days, in the early 90s, you still had the sense that everything had to be big right. and expensive. So Andrew spent $12 million on a set. I mean, Norma Desmond's mansion flew. I mean, is that dramatically relevant? I mean, the only house I've ever seen fly is the one in you know, The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy's house gets caught up in a tornado. Right. And I remember thinking it's, the whole thing felt heavy to me. Uh. It just. It just felt like there was a hangover of another era that seemed to be ending. Oh. And, and it just, it was like so much money was spent and Andrew was spending money. And then of course he had the falling out with Patty Lapone because he hired Glenn Close to go to Broadway instead of Patty and Patty sued him. And then he hired Faye Dunaway to do the show in LA and then he fired her and she sued him. And I covered all that, I covered all that stuff. But I do remember thinking it was kind of the beginning of the end of an era of this heaviness of shows that everything had to be about sets. Right. And, you know, I, I think the sad thing for Andrew, and I did interview Andrew for this book, and, uh, you know, he has many regrets about Sunset Boulevard. Um, but I think they were all caught up in a time where, you know, we, we had the heavy side layer and the tire flew up and cats and we had the barricades and Les Miserables and the helicopter and Miss Saigon, you know, and, and the chandelier and phantom, everything had to be big and huge. And at some point, everything implodes on itself. You just get too big and it falls apart. Right. And it was interesting to me when I was beginning to plot out the scheme for the book, I really did look at the Tony Awards and it was Andrew Lloyd Webber accepting it in 1995 and then giving it to Jonathan Larson for rent. And the, the shift is rent because Jonathan Larson, as I write about in the book, he loved musicals, but he also liked rock music. Right. And Jonathan Larson said, you know, the musicals of today are not touching me. They're not my generation. I cannot relate to some masked man in a chandelier, you know, in the opera house mm -hmm. or some barricades in 1848 in a, French Revolution. These are not connected to what I'm living through now. And what was Jonathan Larson living through? He was living through, I'm living in a city that's falling apart in the early 90s. It's also being somewhat gentrified and I can't afford my rent anymore. My friends are dying of AIDS and some of my friends are drug addicts. And I wanna write a musical that is about what I am going through right now. Right. And I'm gonna write it not in, the old style of musical theater, even though Jonathan knew musical theater very well, I'm going to write music. And if you look, if you go back to listen to the score to Rent, there's some hip hop, there's some little bit of rap in there, there's rock music in there. And Jonathan Larson was on a mission, and I found this out by interviewing all of his friends for this book. He was on a mission to make the musical theater 
relevant again to people his age mm-hmm. in 1930. And, and the tragedy of that is that uh, he made it relevant again, but he never lived to see, um, to, to see what he did. Yeah, the extraordinary work he did. And you have a, um, a great quotation in the book from Jonathan Larson that just struck me. It, it, what he said is so universal for every one of us, everybody listening in on this tonight. And he said, I think you say it was on the last, he said this on the last night of his life. Uh, it's not how many years you live, but how you fulfill the time you spend here. That's sort of the point of the show. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan did not know, of course, um, he was going to die uh, right. that night, but he was surrounded by death because he had many friends who were dying of AIDS. Right, right. And he, you know, there's a myth about Jonathan Larson that, you know, he, he was gay and he died of AIDS. Well, uh, one, he was not gay, and two, he did not die of AIDS. Right. But he had many friends in the artistic community that he was a part of, the bohemian life back in the late 80s and early 90s. So he was surrounded by death. And, you know, he realized, I think, in some level, talking to, I talked to his dad, I talked to his sister about him. And he was very depressed when he was writing Rent, very depressed, because so many friends were sick and so many friends had died. Yeah, yeah. But he also saw friends of his who were, who had AIDS, but who were choosing life over death, Mm -hmm. or just pushing forward. All right, my time is limited, but I have to make the most of it as I can. Right. And Jonathan understood that. And this, this myth that is, you know, I, I, I hope I try to take it down in the book. There was this myth about Jonathan Larson that he came out of nowhere and all the overnight success, and then he died and he didn't live to see it. He was 35 years old. He'd been living in New York for a long time and struggling, struggling, struggling. Right. And Rent was his last stand. And I interviewed a lot of his friends and his family. And they said, they said, you know, Jonathan said to us, if, if Rent doesn't go anywhere, um, this is it for me. I got to figure out what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I mean, this is, the, this is the last thing I have to give to people. I've written three shows. None of them have gone anywhere. But this one show, I think maybe it'll do something, you know, and I just hope it'll hit on because he could not, he could not afford to pay his rent. I mean, right. he called it rent because he couldn't afford to pay his rent. He was really desperate. Yeah. And, no. and, he, and he captured that moment in time. And, and the important thing, Tom, is that um, the shift was there uh, for the musical theater for Broadway that um, Jonathan Larson made Broadway relevant again to a new generation. And there is no Lin-Manuel Miranda who wrote Hamilton. There's no Bobby Lopez who wrote Avenue Q and Frozen. There's no uh, um, um, uh, Brian Yorkey and Tom Kitt who wrote Next to Normal without Jonathan Larson. Right. They fell in love with the musical theater because of what Jonathan Larson did, because yeah. he wrote a show that spoke to them as kids. Well, I think that comes, y- you ground it in the book and give us that perspective, which I think uh, heightens uh, the our awareness of how great Rent was in so many ways. and. Uh, there are some more musicals I want to ask you about, but I actually want to switch gears for a second and talk about uh, one or two straight dramatic plays first, because uh, really one of the things that um, struck me is I want to talk a little bit about Edward Albee, because you in the book you talk about, you know, w- there was the rise of Edward Albee at the time of Virginia Woolf and then the fall of Edward Albee when all the plays were flops and people were saying he's washed up. And then you talk about the big comeback, uh, starting with Three Tall Women in the 90s, kind of a very American thing, you know, the rise, the fall, and then the uh, reevaluation. At the end of his life, do you feel he was had um, was being accorded his justified place as a one of our best dramatists? Yeah, well, I cheated a little bit in the book here because it's about Broadway, but uh, Edward's comeback was off Broadway. Right. Um, But I gotta be totally honest with you. I mean, I knew Edward uh, when I was a student at Columbia University. Edward, who was then in the wilderness, you know, he had not had a hit play for a long, long time. This is the man who wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, The Zoo Story, A Delicate Balance. But in the 80s, when I was a student, Edward was somebody that you would never give, you know, Broadway theater to. 
Mm -hmm. So he was teaching a class at Columbia and I took a class from him and we became kind of friendly. And he was the most, he is to this day, he's the most fascinating but enigmatic character I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And he liked me probably because I was young and pretty back in those days. Uh, but, <laughs> but we never had an affair. Uh, <laughs> but, but we kept in touch. And every now and then there'd be a little off-Broadway show that Edward would do that maybe two people would cover. But I was uh, a kid reporter at the Daily News. And I would always call Edward. And I would say, you know, Mr. I always called him Mr. Albee. Right. Mr. Albee, could I uh, interview you uh, for this new play that you're doing off-Broadway? He said, yes. And Edward, he had this gun, he had this gunslinger mustache back in the days. Like, yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you, Michael. He was very and then one day we had lunch. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said, He said, you know, Michael, I've 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 written a new play. Would you like to read it? I said, Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Albee, I'd I'd love to. He said, Well, and they out of a satchel he pulled out this manuscript and he said, take a look, see what you think. So I went home and the very first time that I met Edward Albee, when I took his class, I had to read Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And when you read that play, Tom, as you know, you cannot stop reading it. Right. I mean, first time you, Jesus H. Christ, what a dump, right? right. The, first, the first line from Martha. And then you keep, and you can't, you cannot believe and I'm, you know, 18 or 19 when I'm reading this play. And I thought, oh my God, this man is a genius. And how is this man forgotten? Right. When I read the script that he gave me, it was called Three Tall Women. When I read that, I thought I'm having the same feeling I had when I read Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf for the first time. And I called Edward and I said, I said, you know, Mr. Albee, I said, I think it's pretty good. It reminds me of uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And I remember he said, well, it should. It's about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, you know, it's I mean, my favorite chapter in my book, Singular Sensation, is the chapter about Edward Albee because he was, he was written off by every critic Nobody would produce a play by Edward Albee. His, his last play on Broadway was, I think, in 1983, The Man Who Had Three Arms. And Frank Rich, who was then the drama critic for the New York Times, wrote an excoriating review saying, you know, it's too bad that Edward Albee, who once had talent, now no longer does. Ooh. He was gone. He was gone. Yeah. And yet he came. That play, uh, Three Tall Women, first of all, he could not, the Schubert's, the Nederlanders, nobody Nobody would produce that play. Right. Edward Albee, he was ancient history. The very first production of Three Tall Women was in Vienna in Austria because nobody in New York was interested in producing an Edward Albee play. Wow. And then it got here to Westchester. There was a theater in Westchester mm -hmm. where it was done with, uh, with the great uh, Myra Carter and Marion Seldes. And wonderful story. I don't want to give too much away in the book, but I have to tell you this because it really, it really touched me. Um, I knew Myra Carter, I knew Marion Seldes, but they're all dead now. Uh, so I could not interview them for this chapter on Edward and Edward was gone too. But Jordan Baker, who was the, uh, the young woman in Three Tall mm -hmm. Women, she was the young one. I could get to her and I interviewed her. And she told me, kind of a moving story, I think. She said, you know, my brother had died of AIDS. My agent had AIDS. Remember, this is back in the early 90s. And I was really, really depressed and sad. And my agent called me. He was dying, but he called me and he said, you know, there's this play by Edward Albee and no one really cares about Edward Albee anymore. But it's going to be done up in some little theater in Westchester. And I think it's probably good for you having taken care of your brother when he died just to go up there and live in a cabin and get away. And you're gonna be with Marion Seldes and Myra Carter. So Jordan goes up there and um, she's with Myra and uh, Marion and Edward. And they do a table reading of the play of Three Tall Women. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the play, Three Tall Women, which we had that great revival with- um, uh, Glenda Jackson. Glenda Jackson, yeah, yeah. At the end of it, it's just, it's about death. It's about, you know, when we stop, when we can stop. Mm. 
And Myra Carter, when she said that, that a table reading, and she said, when we can stop, when we can finally stop, she looked up at Edward and she said, this is going to be your next fucking Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and three tall women did win the Pulitzer Prize. There you the go. drama that year. And Edward Albee came back with tremendous revivals. I mean, a delicate balance with Elaine Stritch, right. our, our old pal, George Grizzard, uh, and then uh, a great revival of Who's Afraid of, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Kathleen Turner and um, uh, Bill Irwin. Right. And then Edward came back, you know, at 75 years old, he writes The Goat or Who Was Sylvia, which totally shocked Broadway. Right. He had the most amazing comeback. And I, you know, I tried to tell that story in my book. Yeah, he said, he, you know, you make him, he, he clearly was such a fascinating guy and so complicated. And it, so while we're on this thread of these uh, complicated, fascinating personalities, I think my favorite part of the book, because it was the part I knew the least about, was you really do a thorough portrait of Garth Drabinsky. <laughs> and, and, you know, we all knew there were the difficulties, but you really explain the pattern of his life and it, this, he had to live as a mogul. And uh, the, the quote, uh, quotation I want to read back to you that I just thought summed it up so well uh, was you quote Richard Mal Maltby talking about the fact that working with Garth and he, you know, if you worked with him, he made you think you were the best, the greatest ever. And the quote was Richard Maltby saying, you know, it's a con, but you want to believe it. <laughs> and, right? That's a great quotation. And, and do you think, it, so did that happen in fact with both the creative personnel and with the, the financial backers? Yes, I mean, the story of Garth Drabinsky, which I think I tell uh, in the book in, the, in a way no one else has told that, and probably people don't even know who Garth Drabinsky is these days, but as yeah, you can know- you, Can Tom, you just give a couple of sentences for yeah. people that might not yeah. be sure? So Garth Drabinsky, uh, he created Cineplex Odeon, and Garth Drabinsky invented the multiplex. Remember, we used to go to one movie theater. Garth right. created many screens. So you would go to basically a mall, and you could have your choice of seven shows seven movies. Garth created that. And Garth was born in Canada uh, and became a, a, a Hollywood mogul. Uh, but he was always wanting to expand and spend money and spend money. And eventually his partner, uh, which at the time I think was a Lou Wasserman at MCA Universal. Right. They were like, my God, this man that we've gone into partnership with is a lunatic. He's spending so much money. So they severed ties with Garth. But part of Garth's exit package was he had the Canadian rights to Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Phantom of the Opera. That's what they gave him. Wow. And Garth did a production in Toronto, which I saw, because I was you know, born and raised in Rochester, New York. So we didn't go to New York City to see shows. We went to Toronto to see shows. And I saw The Phantom of the Opera up there in Toronto. And Garth put on the best production of The Phantom with Colm Wilkinson, mm -hmm. who was in uh, Les Miserables. Right. It was a great production. And the show was a massive hit. And on that foundation of The Phantom of the Opera, Garth Drabinsky built this empire called Livent. And it was a publicly traded company. You could buy stock in it on the New York Stock Exchange and then the Toronto Stock Exchange. And Garth did live shows. He did Kiss of the Spider Woman, he did um, uh, uh, Ragtime. He did Showboat, that wonderful production that Hal Prince directed of Showboat. Yep. And Garth was a major, major player in the 1990s. But I will tell you this, Tom, I remember I, I took my old friend, an old Broadway producer, long dead, uh, but one of the canniest people I've ever met in my life named Arthur Cantor. Remember mm -hmm. Arthur Cantor? Yeah. Great guy, Arthur Cantor. I took Arthur as my date to the opening of Showboat uh -huh. at, the, at the Gershwin Theater. And it was the opening night. This was a $10 million revival of Showboat. I mean, Showboat is a great show, but for $10 million, you know, a little excessive, let's say. And I remember Garth Drabinsky came on after the end of the show, and it was a wonderful production. It was one of Hal's, you know, greatest achievements. Hal came on and Garth brought the cast out. He brought the stage hands out. He brought the ushers on. And I remember Arthur Cantor just shaking his head thinking, 
I don't understand this. I don't understand this. And I said, well, Arthur, what don't you understand? He said, I don't know how this show can ever make any money. It's just, there's so many people on that stage. Right. How can it make money? And that was the moment where I thought, maybe Garth Drabinsky spends too much money. And then as Garth got bigger and bigger and bigger, we began to hear from people like Arthur Cantor and from our friends at the Schubert organization, they all were scratching their heads saying, none of this makes sense. He spends so much money on these shows, so much money on advertising. Where's the money coming from? Where is it coming from? And so there was that little suspicion that I always had about him. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the end of the day, it turned out that uh, Garth Drabinsky, his entire empire, was a complete and total fraud. Right. He kept two sets of books. The one set of books he showed to his investors, the stock exchange that said, oh, every show is making a ton of money. Mm -hmm. The secret set of books was a set of books that said the sea of red ink is widening and deepening. And it was all a scam. And at the end of the day, Garth Rubinsky went to jail for fraud. Well, it, it, it's like something out of the producers, which is something I wanted to ask you about next, which is, you know, you're great in uh, talking about how the producers came about and the movie and Mel Brooks. And, you know, it was such a, a huge hit and such a fun show. But you raise an interesting point in the book, which is, I, you know, I, granted, it won all those Tony Awards. It ran for six years. But I think people thought it was going to run for 10 years, 12 years. And one of the things you talk about is, do you think the identity of the producers ultimately was uh, tied too closely to Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick? Yeah, I mean, listen, I remember when the producers opened and it was absolutely... It, the opening night of the producers, it was on the front page of every newspaper in New York. Right. New York Times, yeah. New York Post, the Daily News. It was the biggest show of all time. Uh, and it was there because of Mel Brooks, no question about it. Yeah. And Susan Stroman, the great Susan Stroman who directed and choreographed it. Yeah. But Matthew and Nathan brought a kind of chemistry to it that you cannot, you can't replicate. I mean, Tom, you know, you've been a stage, you've been, you've been backstage your whole life. You know, you're a Lane Stritch, you're Nathan Lane, or you're not. And you cannot, you can't create those people. Right. And the problem was, I think for the producers, as good a show as it was, and it's a very fine show, no question about it, but Matthew and Nathan together, and as I show in the book, I mean, that chemistry took a little time to gel. And uh, some people were concerned about Matthew Broderick. In fact, uh, there was some talk about firing him in Chicago, as I detail in the book, because right. Matthew was not quite at the level of Nathan Lane, but Nathan understood that there was chemistry happening here that no one else could see. And when that chemistry, when Nathan, uh, sorry, when Matthew finally rose to the level of Nathan, right. you had one of the most amazing opening nights I've ever been to on Broadway. And you had that amazing year Right. You know, uh, 2001, the spring of 2001, of Matthew and Nathan dominating. It was it was bigger than Broadway. I mean, everybody <laughs> wanted to see the producers. Right. Everybody wanted to see it. And it just, it took off like a rocket. And the problem was, and we got through September 11th, as we talked about earlier, and Matthew and Nathan, you know, they soldiered through and they brought that show back as they brought Broadway back. But when they left, there was a diminishment on the show hmm. because they were so closely identified with it. Right. And then the producers of the producers made a, they made a big mistake. Uh, they hired this guy named Henry Goodman, who was an English actor, very fine, very fine actor. No question about it. Very fine actor. And Henry Goodman, also a musical comedy person. He was known for sh his Shakespeare roles, but he was in Guys and Dolls in London and did very, very well. So they hired him to replace Nathan Lane. And the problem was that he was English and he could not get the rhythms of Mel Brooks. Mm. And you know, those rhythms are, th those are New York Jewish rhythms. Right. That's what they are. You know, that's Mel Brooks, Sid Caesar, 
that whole Larry Gelbart, that whole writer's room of guys. Yeah. You can't put an English guy into that room. He doesn't get it. And so I have heard when Nathan left, I'd heard from friends of mine in the show, and I, and I, I kind of detailed this in the book, that they were scared because this new guy, Henry Goodman, playing Max Bialystok, is not getting laughs. Not getting the laughs. So I thought, oh, well, I better check this out. So I, so I, I, did, I bought a ticket. Don't, don't, don't tell the producers of the producers, <laughs> but I secretly bought a ticket to the Wednesday matinee before this English actor, Henry Goodman, was going to open. And I'll never forget this. So I'm, and I bought a ticket at the last row so no one would see me. You know, I, just, I bought a cheap seat when they were cheap. And, well, they'll be cheap again when we come back after the pandemic. But I sat in the last row of the orchestra. And Henry Goodman comes on as Max Bialystok. And he has this line. He's, and Nathan got a laugh every time. He said, when I was young and gay, but straight, big laugh. Henry Goodman said, when I was young and gay, but straight, no laugh. Right. And then I heard this banging behind me. And I turned, and it was Mel, Mel Brooks. He was at the back of the house. And he was banging the wall at every laugh line that Henry Goodman did not get. Ooh. So intermission comes and I see Mel and Tom Meehan who wrote the uh, producers yeah. with, with Mel. And we went to Angus McIndoe, which was the restaurant next door to the theater. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, they were just, what do we do? What do we do? And I said to them, I said, guys, listen, you know, I'm a big champion of the producers. I love you guys, but you cannot open with this man because if you do, you're going to get killed by the critics you're going to get killed. And Mel was like, don't panic, don't panic, panic, panic. <laughs> and then I get a call from the press agent uh, the next day and they said, okay, Michael, um, we're going to give you a story. It's going to be exclusive to you, but we have to plot it out. So don't run it on Friday, do it for the Monday paper in the New York Post. I said, okay. We're firing Henry Goodman because we, Mel and Tom have heard what you said and they know the show cannot open, reopen with this guy. And they fired him. And I had the exclusive front page story in the New York Post that they fired Henry Goodman. And they put in um, Brad Oscar, I think it was, who was, uh, who was uh, the understudy. And Brad was great and terrific. And, uh, yeah. But the show, frankly, as I show in the book, it never recovered from that. It was, it was so closely caught up with Matthew and Nathan and their fabulous chemistry that without the two of them, as good as the show is, it just, it, it became a show that you didn't want to see anymore. If you missed it with Matthew and Nathan, you missed something and why bother? Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you also about another blockbuster show that you write about in the book uh, uh, in great detail and it's really fascinating and that's The Lion King. And, uh, you, you know, that extraordinary work that Julie Taymor did. But if you could, the thing that really struck me was if you could talk a little bit about how, in a way, The Lion King almost didn't happen after that disastrous presentation to the Disney executives you talk about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, Disney had come to Broadway with Beauty and the Beast, which was, frankly, a kind of a boring theme park show and we all hated Disney back in those days. We thought, oh my God, this is the end of Broadway as we know it. It's going to be, you know, Times Square is going to become a theme park. And so uh, Michael Eisner, who was then running Disney, um, and, and Beauty and the Beast, as much as we hated it, was a big success. I mean, it made yeah. a lot of money. So Disney recognized there was money to be, to be made on Broadway. But Michael Eisner thought, all right, we're, we're going to do this other show, The Lion King, big hit movie but we can't do it the same way we did Beauty and the Beast. So he, he talked to his guys, uh, Peter Schneider and Tom Schumacher, who were then running the theater department. He said, come up with some, something else, just, you know, whatever, just make it more interesting. I think, you know, Michael's not a, Michael's not a, he, not a complicated guy intellectually. He's like, just make it interesting, you know, make it something interesting, right. different. And it was Tom Schumacher and Peter Schneider who said, well, you know, because those guys, they came from the avant-garde theater world and they were working at Disney uh, in the animation department. And then they took over the theater department. And I said, well, why don't we talk to our old pal, Julie Taymor, you know, this avant-garde director that used to do these crazy kind of things that we used to see. 
Mm -hmm. So they called Julie and Julie was like, well, I'd never heard of the Lion King because to me it was a cartoon. She says in my book, it was a cartoon. So they had to send her a VHS for her to look at the cartoon, but she found something kind of profound in it. And I think what she found in it was a very um, fundamental mythological story about a boy who has to become his father, a boy who has to step up to the plate and become a man. Right. And that's a, I mean, that's a story that has been told many, many times. And Julie saw that and she went for that idea, the boy who must become a man. And then she brought her extraordinary puppetry to it. Mm -hmm. But the problem with Julie's puppetry is that it, back then it was very strange. It was, it wasn't puppets as we think of hand puppets. It was, you could see the puppeteers moving the puppets at the same time. And, you know, people had this thing on their head that was a puppet, but they were also actors. And they did this workshop for Michael Eisner and the, um, the people from California. And it was in, uh, I think it was at 890 Broadway, the old Michael Bennett place. Right. Uh, and it was, you know, a rehearsal room. It was in the middle of the day. The puppets hadn't been painted the lights there was no lighting it was just you know the sun shining in and julie had these people manipulating these things and some person with this head thing on their head and this that and the other thing and as michael eisner left one of his uh, lieutenants said I, I don't get this at all i mean do we look at the face of the actor do we look at that african thing on their head what are we doing here this makes no sense at all and michael eisner said to tom schumacher he said pull the plug on this. Hmm. It's over with. And then as all those fancy Hollywood people got into their SUVs to go back to JFK, to fly back on their private planes to LA, Peter Schneider, Tom Schumacher, and Julie Tamer were left on the curb by themselves. And it was Peter Schneider who said to Julie, he said, Julie, we failed you. We have not shown your work in the best possible way. We have to get this back in front of Michael again. And this time we're going to do it in a theater Everything is going to be painted properly. Everything's going to be lit brilliantly by Don Holder. Mm -hmm. And so they did another workshop for an audience of one. And that one person was Michael Eisner. And Julie came up with three different versions of The Lion King. The first version was kind of like cats, you know, with people with fur and leotards and this kind of thing. The other one was kind of a hybrid of cats and Julie's vision. And the last one that they did was Julie's fundamental vision of the puppetry by seeing the puppets and the puppeteer at the same time. Right. And Michael Eisner sat there. Now he's in the Palace Theater in the 10th row. Everything's lit brilliantly by Don Holder. Julie's painted all the headdresses. Everything is beginning to come together. And Michael Eisner made one of the great, well, the great decision in the history of showbiz. He said, you know what? The bigger the risk, the bigger the payoff. Julie, we're going with your original vision. And to this day, The Lion King has now grossed worldwide $10 billion, making it the most successful entertainment property of all time. Wow. The most successful of all yep. time. Wow. Well, then, uh, Michael Eisner's role, kind of as the giving the go-ahead, in a way he was the most important critic that show ever faced when they presented it for him. And I... Uh, Michael, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of the things that really struck me at the end of the book is when you talk about how the role of critics has changed so much now uh, from the Broadway of the 1990s. It's completely different than that because of the rise of the internet. And I, the, the quotation I wanted to read to you that sort of made my uh, eyes pop out a little bit was when... Um, talking about the role of the critics and Jacques Lesord said, yeah. old, old critics are tossed onto the slag heap in the alley like old computer monitors were obsolete equipment. And, and do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, Jacques, uh, I, I, you know, I knew all the great critics, John Simon, Mike Couchoir from the AP, uh, Jacques Lesseur, they're all dead now, sadly, but they were, they were the, they were uh, the people who taught me a lot about, um, not only about the theater, but about life. They were great yeah. friends of mine. Um, they wrote with muscularity and vibrancy and excitement. Um, but, you know, things changed. The internet came along. 
And my book ends, you know, at the end of the 90s when the internet is just all that chat, you know, those kind of things are just coming along now. Right. And that would change everything. But yeah, I do think critics, I think critics were uh, diminished in many ways. One, because uh, the new ones today uh, don't write as well as the old ones, frankly. Uh, and also I think, um, you know, Broadway became, as it was chasing that tourist dollar, all that money you could make from tourists. Mm -hmm. Broadway became a place where most of its audience never cared about who wrote for a New York City newspaper. Right. You know, you know I think the last time I looked, by the end of my book, uh, Singular Sensation, The Triumph of Broadway, an ironic title, which I can tell you why it's ironic. Um, I think at the end of the 90s, things were beginning to change. Broadway was so big. The shows were so well known, Rent, The Lion King, The Producers. And Broadway was pursuing an audience from around the world. And they really did not really care what some critic for the New York Times, the New York Post, or the Daily News had to say. Right. I think what's going to change, and maybe this could be interesting, when Broadway comes back after this pandemic, the first people to come back to the theater are going to be New Yorkers, not tourists. Right. So Broadway people are going to have to offer New Yorkers something more than, you know, Phantom of the Opera and Wicked and uh, Hamilton, those shows that most New Yorkers have already seen. You're going to have to offer them something unusual, something fresh to entice them to come back to the theater. And maybe it'll be a good play. Maybe it'll be the new Edward Albee who comes back. And maybe there'll be a good, good critic who says, this is the new Edward Albee. But mm -hmm. I don't hold out much hope for criticism. I mean, I think... The New York Times is, you know, is is still the most powerful newspaper uh, in for, for for the theater. But I think the Times is now caught up in all this identity kind of politics, and uh, you know, oh, we can't have too many white people anymore, and this, that, and the other thing. So uh, I, I think they're caught up in some kind of politics that's going to diminish their um, their ability to evaluate plays in a good way. I mean, I've been around a long time, Tom, as you have, and. I don't care who wrote the play. You could be, a, you know, the purple-eyed, three-eyed monster from Mars. If the play's good, the play's good. It's not about who wrote it. It's about the play itself. It's about the work. Right. Yeah. And Definitely. I think the Times is now caught up in, oh, you know, you can see it already. It's like, oh, there are oh, too many white people run Broadway, this, that, and the other thing. They have their particular agenda. But at the end of the day, you know, you can put as many plays as you want to by, you know, transgendering people. If the play sucks, people aren't going to go to see it. If a play's good, it doesn't matter who wrote it. Right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So it, then my last question before we take questions from the people listening, uh, Michael, you, you uh, therefore, I think, put on your hat as an epidemiologist. <laughs> and when do you think Broadway, what's your guess when Broadway will reopen? Just your guesswork. I would say uh, vaccine first, of course, and we know that a vaccine is on the way because the actors have to feel safe to go back to work mm -hmm. and the musicians have to feel safe to go back to work. Uh, when does the audience come back? Uh, it's gonna take some time. I mean, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I do know this, Tom, when Broadway reopens, Broadway cannot be as greedy as it was. You cannot say, hey, Hamilton's opening again, and we're going to charge you a thousand bucks to see it. That's right. not going to happen. The Broadway people, our producer friends, our theater owner friends, our union friends, they have to figure out a way to make those ticket prices affordable to entice New Yorkers because they're not, they're not going to be tourists for a long time. Right. For a long time. Yeah. You have, to say to tu you have to say to New Yorkers, come back to the theater. We're not going to charge you a thousand bucks to see Hamilton. We'll charge you 150 bucks, maybe. Right. Broadway has to come back with ticket prices that are reasonably priced that will entice New Yorkers to come back to the theater because people will be scared. Yeah. It's, the, vac the vaccine is not going to listen. I, I deal with this every morning I'm on, on my radio show. I talk to doctors all the time. They say, yeah, the vaccines are on the way, but it's going to take a long time to vaccinate all of the people on the planet. Right. It's not going to happen tomorrow. You know, we're not going to go to CVS and get the vaccine tomorrow. Yeah. So Broadway's got to figure out how do we bring people back? And the best way you can bring people back is to make the ticket prices affordable again. Because frankly, Tom, as I show in the 90s, Broadway, big success in the 90s. But man, they got greedy. 
and they upped those ticket prices to a point where they said, you know, we don't really care about the regular New Yorker who used to love the theater anymore because all the tourists are pouring into the city from China and Argentina and Europe and they'll pay any price to see our shows. So screw the old New Yorkers who are always there for the theater. Well, you know what? It's time for Broadway to realize the New Yorkers will always be there for the theater, but make them come back at a reasonable ticket price. I, I agree. And I think the one thing everybody can agree on is how much we want Broadway back and how much we want it reopened. It's so important to the city. Um, Michael, you, 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 before we take questions, uh, uh, I just want to say it's a terrific book. It's a great read. And uh, I wish you great success with it. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I have one question in here already uh, that I wanted to, this, this is an interesting question going back to Garth Drabinsky um, from uh, Patrick Pacheco. Oh, our friend Patrick, yes. Our friend Patrick. And he says, to what extent was Garth Drabinsky's handicap as someone who'd survived polio earlier, uh, to what extent did it determine his life, work and career? Well, Garth was uh, stricken with polio as a, as a, as a boy, really. And he had, um, he had a, he had a club foot, you know, and it was very embarrassing to him. I mean, I don't really want to get too much into the psychology of Garth Drabinsky because, uh, you know, that would be actually too scary <laughs> to go down that rabbit hole. But I think that, I think Garth had something to prove all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, he had to show everybody else on the playground that he was as good as they were, even though he was hobbled. But I actually think more than the polio, I think it was actually his being Canadian that really drove him. Right. Because he, he always felt, and I knew Garth, and he always felt that we Americans, we, you know, Canada is like, the, that's that nice little place with Niagara Falls there. And, uh, you know, Toronto has got some needle and maybe you go to, you go to uh, 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 Vancouver and have some good oysters. But Canada was this nice, you know, nice little place that was to the north of us, of this big mass with like 12 people lived there. I think what drove Garth more than his, uh, his club foot with polio was his sense of being a Canadian. Yeah. And you Americans, I'm gonna show you guys, we're not just your friendly, nice neighbors to the north. I can be as rough and as aggressive and as capitalistic as you Americans can be. Right. So I think it was more uh, his being a Canadian than it was being somebody who was stricken with polio. That drove him. Very interesting. Uh, um, okay, here's another uh, question that just came in. Uh, being a big fan of Tennessee Williams' drama style, what contemporary playwright do you see as a successor to his style? Hmm. Very good question, but I, I really, uh, to be honest with you, Tom, I don't see, I don't see artists and writers as really successors to anyone else. There is, where does Tennessee Williams come from? You, you can't say, where does Edward Albee come from? Mm -hmm. Where does Eugene O'Neill come from? Where does Arthur Miller come from? Um, Yes, of course, you know, if you if you plot it out, you can see the, if you look at Edward, you can see the influence of Samuel Beckett on Edward. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't really think you can say, here's the new Tennessee Williams. I mean, I would rather somebody come up and say, oh, this is the new, I, you know, the new Tom Santa Pietro, who's written a play that I couldn't even imagine that anyone could write like that. So I don't look for those kind of things. Who's the new Tennessee Williams? Right. These, these great artists, these great writers, I don't know where they come from. They come from somewhere, but you can't really, you can't make a mold for the next Tennessee Williams. You, you, you just can't. Right. Yeah. They're unto themselves. Exactly. And that's why they're artists. Yeah. Right. Um, now, if anybody else wants to uh, type in questions, go to the chat uh, uh, tab and you can put it in. Um, Michael, here are some, let's see, another question to uh, ask you. Um, okay. Uh, you, hmm, you have a reputation as a columnist of being uh, occasionally snarky. <laughs> Your books don't have this tone. 
Is this the advent of a kinder, gentler Michael Riedel? It's a fair question. Um, but I think when I set out to write my first book, Razzle Dazzle, um, I realized that if I took the snarky attitude that I take for 800 words on a column in mm -hmm. the New York Post on Friday, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of uh, tone would be incredibly tedious over 400 pages. Right. It would just get really boring. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, my books, if they have any value at all, is I went back and I interviewed everybody. Yeah. And I, I took myself out of them. You know, it's not about me. It's about the people who did the things that I never did. I didn't create the Lion King. You know, I didn't do a chorus line. I didn't save the Schubert organization. Um, you know, I did not write uh, Three Tall Women. Uh, so I went back and I in interviewed all the people who did those things, who wrote them, who produced them, who marketed them, who believed in them when no one else believed in some of those shows. A show like Chicago, you know, Fran and Barry Weisler, who produced it on Broadway, they could not raise the money for it because everybody thought Chicago's a concert. Four performances at Encores, who's going to pay $75 on Broadway to see a concert? Right. Nobody believed in that show. You know, I don't, I don't do those kind of things. Those are the people who create, who take the risks. So I, as a columnist, can sit on the sidelines and throw spitballs at them. And it's fun. Believe me, it's great fun. Uh, but for a book to sustain that kind of snarky tone, Oh my God, it would be, first of all, it would be too tedious and annoying for me to write. And it would be unbelievably tedious and annoying for you guys to read. So okay. I, take, I take myself out of that. Ah, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, here, here's, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Uh, this question is, how detrimental do you feel that social media has been or not been to Broadway? Uh, well, I mean, social media is a double-edged sword because you, you know, you find out if the first preview of a show out of town is terrible, you know it right now, you know, some, somebody with a laptop is a Walter Winchell, or now with a cell phone, I should say, is a Walter Winchell. Right. They can say, this show in the Colonial Theater in Boston sucks, right? It used to take us a little while before time we used to hear about if the show sucks <laughs> in Boston. Now we know after the first act right. if the show sucks. But on the other hand, social media is like, I just saw the show and it's tremendous. It's great. It's exciting. So, you know, I actually fundamentally don't think things have changed that much with social media. It's about the work itself. If the work is good, somebody with, a, with an iPhone is going to say, I just saw the show out of town and I loved it. It's great. It's fabulous. Right. I saw the show and it sucks. Probably the show sucks. And when it comes to New York, it will still suck. It was great in Chicago. If it comes to New York, it'll be great in New York. So it's really not about social media. It's just about the artists creating things and doing things. Right. And, you know, the form, the uh, mechanism of how you tell people about shows has changed. I mean, back in the day, it was newspapers and critics, and now it's social media. But social media is only responding to the work. And if the work is good, social media will embrace it. And if it sucks, it will say it sucks. So, you know, it really, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, frankly. Right. It's still showbiz. <laughs> I mean, listen, if the show's great, if I wrote a show and somebody, you know, with a some 20-year-old kid who went to see my new musical in the Colonial Theater in Boston and loved it and posted it online, I'm going to be very happy. Right. If my show is not so good and somebody says, show isn't very good, I'm in trouble. I mean, come on. Ultimately, it's about the show itself, the play, the musical, whatever it is, as good as it is or as bad as it is. It doesn't matter if it's Frank Rich telling you it's bad or good or if it's some little kid with a, uh, you know, a, a, a handheld device telling you if it's good or bad. Well, as far as I know, you haven't yet written a play or a musical, but <laughs> you have written a terrific book. Uh, uh, we, we have to get in the plug. There are signed copies of the book at uh, houseofbooksct.com in Kent, Connecticut. Um, and uh, Michael, it's a, a terrific read, and I, uh, I hope it finds a very wide audience. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And I think that's... Uh, uh, all right, I'll ask, you, I'll ask you one other question that just came in. Okay. Who would you say is the best choreographer on Broadway? Hmm. Today? I think they mean today. 
Well, to be totally honest with you, I really, I mean, I came of age seeing um, Nine. That was the, the big musical that made a big impression on me when I was a kid with Tommy Toon. And I think we've lost that tradition of the director choreographer, Michael Bennett, Bob Fosse, Tommy Toon. Susan Stroman, I think, Susan Stroman definitely is, you know, is, is up there with those greats, but she hasn't done anything uh, in a while now. But I actually kind of think, Tom, that choreography is, is a bit of a lost art now. Hmm. Um, you know, Bob Avian, your friend, he comes from that world. Right. He, he knows that world well. Yep. But, you know, I guess my problem with choreograph choreography today is that the great choreographers, Michael Bennett, Bob Fosse, Jerome Robbins, uh, Bob Avian, Susan Stroman, the choreography, the movement comes from uh, from the um, the drama. It's not imposed on it; it comes from it. Right. So when you look at something like uh, West Side Story, when um, Tony and Maria meet for the first time, the dance at the gym, mm -hmm. and all that jangular Bernstein music going on in the back, and the sharks and the jets, and you, all that tension is there. And then Tony and Maria see each other for the first time and everything is quiet. And all they do is they, they just flutter and they snap da, 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 with a little snap there. Right. That comes from the storytelling. And I find today a lot of choreography is just kind of imposed on it. Uh, right. You mean as opposed to arising out of the characters? Yeah. Themselves. It's like, oh, well, here's a move. We do this. We know this move. We know this dance. We can do this. Yeah, that's a ball change, kick, turn, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. It doesn't really... I mean, I think the I, I always think the great choreographers, Tommy Toon, Michael Bennett, Jerome Robbins, all of those people, they're great dramatists. Yeah. They're yeah. as much a playwright as they are a choreographer because they understand the emotional moment that can only be told in dance. Right. Just the way Sondheim is a dramatist. With yeah, his, absolutely. Yeah. With yeah. Lyrics, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But I, I, I really can't say... It, it actually, I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of shows over my years, but I've never seen anything like, you know, when I was a kid with, you know, that the opening number of nine, that Tommy tune, you were there, right? You saw, you know, yeah. la, 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 la. And Guido Contini conducting all those women as they each, they come on. And every single woman who comes on, Tommy gave that woman her own movement. Right. And yeah. that came from? the drama of, of the show. Right, exactly, yeah. Well, um, uh, we, we could keep going because the, the questions are coming in, but uh, we've already gone over the time limit. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Anytime, thanks Tom, appreciate it. Michael, bye. bye, -bye.